We are wrapping up uh, one of the most partisan and rancorous confirmation hearings. Uh, the best evidence of that, I think, is President Trump uh, at a White House swearing in ceremony, essentially saying this. What happened to the Kavanaugh family violates every notion of fairness, decency and due process. Our country, a man or a woman, must always be presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. And with that, I must state that you, sir, under historic scrutiny, were proven innocent. Thank you. I guess my first question for you, Senator Merkley, is... Brett Kavanaugh took his seat at the court on Tuesday, business as usual. We're all papered over and moving on. How do you think about what has happened and how quickly we've torqued to this is the new reality? Well, I've I've got to tell you that I think the wounds are extremely deep. Uh, The bitterness is, is very high because there has been a lot of damage done to both the Senate and enormous damage done to the integrity of the Supreme Court. And what do you, I want to talk about the Senate in a minute, but when you talk about the integrity of the Supreme Court, one of the paradoxes, of course, is that the Supreme Court, all nine members are now going to collude in performing normalcy. They have to do that. Um, We talk so much on this show about how the justices, the one thing they have is the public respect and reverence for the institution. And so, you know, on Tuesday, we had Justice Kagan giggling with Judge Kavanaugh, Justice Sotomayor pinching Justice Gorsuch. Uh, They're going to just double down on the proposition that everything is fine at the court. So when you talk about the integrity of the court, what does that look like to you? Just a public sense that the thing is broken, regardless of what they're showing us? Well, the members of the court certainly will do what they can to make things look normal, but they're not normal at, at all. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that the court, which uh, was viewed with respect as I grew up, as a, a series of, of umpires weighing the the respective provisions of the Constitution uh, against each other and uh, against the uh, evolving uh, strategies of society, uh, are now viewed as basically a super legislature. They're super legislating on issues involving the environment, uh, on workers, on women's reproductive rights, on the issue of uh, corporate power and corporate speech, a whole series of things that largely boil down to a vision among the five uh, Republican members of the court uh, as how to create government by and for the powerful in opposition to the constitutional vision of government by and for the people. Both the, the stolen Supreme Court seat stolen from President Obama and delivered to President Trump and filled by Neil, uh, Neil Gorsuch. And this nominee, who couldn't uh, meet the standards to serve on any form of, of, of court, let alone the, the Supreme Court, this is lasting, lasting damage. My question for you is, isn't this just a mirror image of what Republicans have said about the court when liberals control the court. In other words, they're just regulating. They're making up law from the bench. They answer to no one. Isn't this ultimately just disserving the idea of the rule of law and this neutral court that we all need to believe in in order to function in a constitutional democracy? In other words, the kind of politicization you're describing, doesn't it ultimately just undermine the idea of this independent third branch? Well, we simply have to call the the facts as as they are, not as we wish them to be. In my lifetime, I've watched the Supreme Courts in country after country become politicized, make extraordinary rulings uh, that uh, change the course of those, those countries. And I would think, uh, well, it's it's great that we have a, a truly uh, set of in, impartial jurists struggling to get it right with in terms of implementing the Constitution, but we no longer have that. And so to pretend otherwise is to live in a fantasy world, a, a world of what what we once had and and uh, and certainly would hope for again, but do not have now. You've really given voice to the idea that the White House had way 
too strong a hand on the steering wheel this time around. And, you know, you make the point that uh, they were the ones who were claiming privilege about 100,000 pages of documents. And they also, uh, I think you've argued, had way too much control over the FBI investigation. Is that uh, also something new? Is that a a big shift that the White House has generally stood back and let uh, the Senate do its work? Or is this just par for the course, the White House protects their nominee? Uh, It is not par for the the course. And uh, in that case of the president exercising presidential privilege, uh, normally you think of that in the context of a president protecting internal conversations of that White House. In this case, however, it was about records from a previous president. It wasn't presidential privilege on behalf of President Bush. It was presidential privilege on behalf of President Trump. And Normally, if an, if a, and by the way, these terms are synonymous. They're using it synonymous with executive privilege. So normally, when a president exercises executive privilege, there's a log cap saying this document cannot be disclosed because it meets this test of executive privilege. There was no such log or index for the 100,000 documents that were stamped uh, presidential privilege. And for the Senate to allow the White House to block its efforts to review those documents is a complete institutional failure. And it's a, it's not that the Senate didn't request those documents. The chair of judiciary did ask for them. But the fact that, that he and, and the majority did not then defend the Senate's role in being able to review information, that is, that is where the uh, majority really fell down. And it wasn't just this. In addition, uh, the White House lawyer, Don McGahn, he called over uh, Republican leaders when they requested information on the three years of uh, his service, Kavanaugh's service as staff secretary, something that had been requested by the Senate. And he said essentially to these uh, senators, uh, don't request those documents. So they, they came back and they said, okay, we're not requesting those three years. So three years of incredibly important information got blanked out. That's separate and distinct from the 100,000 documents that mark, got marked presidential privilege. And it doesn't even end there, because then the same individual, empowered by the White House to mark documents presidential privilege, then marked 140,000 pages of documents as committee confidential to prevent the public from being able to see them and to prevent committee members and senators from seeing and, dis- well, they got to see them privately (laughs) in a special room, but they couldn't discuss the contents with the public or with their staff or with experts. And and so there was massive compromise from one end to the other of uh, of, of the ability of the Senate to review his record. And the question everyone would say, okay, so what was the president hiding? What did they want to hide with with 100,000 documents stamped presidential privilege? We know that during that time, he worked on issues related to torture. We know he he received stolen documents from Senate Democrats after he had said he didn't. Then we, then we did find emails that said he did, even without those 100,000 documents. Uh, we know that he worked on various nominations and weighed in on those nominations. What did he say? Uh, we would have learned a great deal about his partisanship and his judicial perspective from those documents. That's what the president was hiding, and this is unacceptable. And I filed suit to get those documents. Unfortunately, I waited until the committee forwarded it to the full Senate, because I'm not a member of the committee, immediately filed suit, but time ran out. Uh, I, I wish I had done it differently. I wish I had filed immediately upon the uh, use of presidential privilege instead of waiting until the issue came to the broader Senate. Uh, that's a lesson learned. If we ever see this in the future, the Senate has to stand up and protect their responsibility under the Constitution to review the record of nominees.